Hello and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness. It's New Year's Eve, and this is the third holiday in a row that you and I have spent together. Things are starting to get serious between us. Next thing you know, you'll be inviting me home to meet your family. Speaking of which, tonight we once again delve into the realm of family, reaching out from beyond the grave to let us know that love never dies. That's a good message to bring for the new year, don't you think? Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for new content. And if you like tonight's video, give it a thumbs up and comment below. But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way. And let's get scared together, 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 together. My grandma died of emphysema when I was three. The only memory I have of her was visiting in the hospital, seeing her hooked up to breathing tubes. When she spoke to tell me that she loved me, the sound terrified me, and I ran to my mother and cried. After my grandma died, my aunt gave me a small teddy bear dressed up in an angel outfit. If you squeezed its stomach hard enough, it said, I'm your guardian angel. I'm your special friend. Even though it sounds creepy, I always thought it was cute. Anyway, years later when I was a teenager, I had a dream about my grandma, which was odd because I don't really remember much about her being so young when she passed. After I woke up, I started getting ready for school, but I kept thinking about this dream. I went to the closet to get my clothes. The left side of my closet held my clothes, but the other side is filled with old stuff like boxes of holiday decorations. As I opened the door, I heard, I'm your guardian angel. I'm your special friend. I froze. I didn't even know that teddy bear angel was in those boxes. I had honestly forgotten all about it. No one had even touched those boxes for months. I would have thought the batteries would be dead because at that point it was already 10 years old. Plus, there was no possible way for that bear to be squeezed hard enough by anything in that box to make it talk. You had to squeeze pretty hard to get that mechanism to work. That was the first and last time that I ever heard that bear while it was in the box, right after I saw my grandma in the dream. Initially, I was creeped out but then I realized it was her way of letting me know that she's watching over me and that she loves me. It's the only unexplained thing that's ever happened to me, so I'm glad it was a positive one. I never told anyone at the time, because it felt kind of special, so I decided to keep it to myself. She was my paternal grandmother, and I only recently told my dad about it, because we just lost my grandfather, and he took it pretty hard. When I told him, he started crying, and he said he'd wished I'd told him earlier, but that he understood that I wanted to keep it to myself. He said he knows that she's watching over us all, and that she loved me very much. And he wishes that I would have gotten a chance to know her. I grew up in a small town in Kansas with my mom and dad. My grandma lived a few miles down the road from us. This was during the 80s when I could walk to her house without fear of being kidnapped or subjected to violence. No, the violence was in my home, under my father's rule. So I often played outside until late at night, and I would also walk to my grandma's house quite a few times to get away from the chaos. My time spent with grandma was wonderful. I loved her more than anything, and she loved me more than anything, too. When I was still a child, Grandma would drive to Branson, Missouri every summer to act in a play there called The Toby Show. My family would drive there many times to see her acting in this play. Well, one day, my dad got a telephone call from Grandma. She'd driven a different route and gotten lost. This was before GPS and cell phones. So we got into the family car and with very limited directions, 
we were finally able to locate her in some small town whose name I could never remember. But I do remember waking up in the back seat and looking around. There was a train bridge behind us, and my grandma's name, Joan, was spray-painted high up on the bridge. We had run out of gas maybe 10 feet from a Texaco gas station, so we got gas, picked up grandma off the side of the road, and eventually we all drove to Branson, the place that grandma loved. Fast forward 25 years, I met a really nice woman while visiting Missouri. We quickly fell in love and before I knew it, I was packing up all of my belongings and moving to Missouri to get married. While driving to work one morning, everything fell into place. The Texaco gas station to my left, the train bridge right in front of me. The spray paint with the name Joan had long ago faded, but there it still was. Anderson, Missouri, where I now lived with my new wife, was the same place that we found my grandma stranded all those years ago. And my wife reminded me a lot of my grandmother, but sadly, we ended up divorcing. It was during the final year of my marriage that my grandmother passed away. Because of her death and knowing that my marriage was over, I felt like my world was falling apart. While cleaning out my grandma's house, I didn't want much. But there was one thing that I absolutely had to have. It was a shoebox-sized copper musical train. I still have that train. Here's what it looks like. And that's my grandma in the photo. You wind it up in the back and it plays the song, I've Been Working on the Railroad. I've had that train for close to 12 years now, and everybody knows the rule. Do not touch that train. It's all I have left of my grandmother, so it has a place of honor in my home. It's on a shelf where I can always see it. But here's the weird part. I don't wind it up, but sometimes it still plays, but only if my grandmother is sending a message through the train. For instance, after my divorce, I moved to Oklahoma and had a terrible relationship with a new woman. She hated that train because sometimes it would play a few musical notes when she'd get near it. Not every time, just occasionally, but it freaked her out. I don't think Grandma approved of her. I finally left that relationship and moved back to Missouri for the second time. And the first week I was there, I really wondered if I hadn't made a serious mistake. I was broke, had no job, had barely any food, but was somehow able to swing the first month's rent on a very small place. I was so stressed out about trying to find a job that I sat down on my couch and began to cry. As soon as I started to cry, the train sang out three simple notes. I started to laugh because I knew everything would be okay. Grandma just said so with those three notes. A year later, I moved to a much nicer house and met a new girlfriend that same year. We were sitting on the couch getting to know one another when the train let out three more notes. So I told this girl everything about my grandmother and the train. Fast forward another year and this same girl and I were in a huge fight. We had both been drinking pretty heavily and I was so sick of fighting with her that I went outside to cool off and get away from her. Not long after, she came running out of the house, crying and begging my forgiveness. Turns out, right after I had gone outside, my girlfriend was so angry, she grabbed a gun intending to come after me. That's when my grandma's train began playing for a few seconds. She somehow knew that my grandmother was mad at her, and she could just feel her spirit in there, trying to stop her from hurting me and herself. It sobered her up instantly, and after that, she quit drinking so much. About a week later, my girlfriend and I were talking about the incident. It was still messing with her head, the thought of how bad things could have gone that night had the train not stopped her. So for the first time in maybe a decade, I decided to wind the train up and play the entire song all the way through. But when I tried, the key wouldn't even turn and nothing would play. 
so I carefully removed the tiny screws from the music box. And when I did, I saw that the inside was absolutely packed with dust. There was simply no way that train could have played even a single note. It took me maybe half an hour to carefully clean out every piece of dust matted inside, then oil the moving parts. Now it works again, but I let it sit silent until my grandmother wants to send me another message. My mom died when I was six years old, and my dad when I was ten. Since I was a kid, I've always been a very firm believer in the paranormal. I'm 20 now, and one day I was in the backyard with my cousin's three children, watching them and keeping them occupied. I was playing Littlest Pet Shop with the oldest girl, Heavenly, and she was about five at the time. She was always very serious about playing house with these little plastic toy pets, and she always made sure that I followed her rules. She was very engrossed in the game, but I was only giving it about half of my attention, glancing over my shoulder now and then when the two boys grew too quiet. At one point I had to go over and scold the boys for getting into the garden, and while I did, I heard Heavenly yelling that someone was at the back gate. I was dragging the two boys out of the garden, so I had no idea that she had abandoned her game and gone to the back gate. She kept saying, he wants to come in and say hi. He wants to come in and say hi. She kept repeating it. I made my way over to the gate to see who she was talking about. You have to let him in. He wants to say hi to you, she kept saying. Then she began shaking the back gate, trying to get it open for whomever was on the other side wanting to say hi to me. I didn't see anybody. Who wants to say hi to me, I asked. He looks like Grandpa, and he told me that he wants to say hi to you. But Grandpa's inside watching TV. Do you want to go say hi to Grandpa? No, let him in, she begged. Then, as if someone flipped a switch, she stopped shaking the gate, and she looked up at me with very sad eyes. He's gone. He told me to tell you he wanted to say hi. Then, she walked back to her toys, as if nothing had happened. It was at that point that I had a wave of sadness and understanding. She said he looked like her grandpa. Well, her grandpa is my father's brother, and they did look alike. I called out to my cousin to please come and watch the kids for a second. Then I ran upstairs and grabbed a framed photograph of my mom and dad and took it to the backyard. Did the guy at the gate look like him? I pointed to my father. Yeah, that's him. He looks just like Grandpa, and he wanted to say hi, she repeated again. I 100% believe that my father came to see me that day, because my cousin's children never met my father. Heavenly is the oldest of her kids, and she was born the day after my father died. My mom married my stepdad when I was 11, after four years of dating. He had a very large family with many brothers, but one brother always stood out for me. He was so handsome. He was older with snow white hair and the most extraordinary blue eyes. His name was Joe. When I was a teenager, Joe developed bone cancer, and he suffered terribly before he died. Eventually, I graduated and moved across country, and I never saw most of my stepfather's family members again. One day, my aunt and I stopped in this funky little metaphysical shop a few towns over. We love psychics and their readings, and we were always taking them with a grain of salt. But that day, I had a reading that made me a firm believer. The psychic was just telling me a few fun things, but then, out of the blue, she said that there was a very handsome older gentleman there, and he had the most extraordinarily beautiful blue eyes, and he wanted to see me. I smiled, and I told her I knew who it was, 
and she said that he wanted to tell me that he feels good now, that there's no more pain. It was such an unexpected message. It was so sweet and made me happy. I didn't tell my stepdad until 20 years later, as he neared the end of his life. My stepdad was a very practical man, a farmer without a sliver of whimsy, and I didn't think he would appreciate a story about a psychic. But one afternoon we were talking about his brothers, and at that point there were only three of them left alive, so I told him about Joe and his message. Instantly tears started rolling down his face. I had never seen him cry before, and it startled me. But I knew I had done the right thing by telling him. My grandfather had always been my one and only friend. We would talk for hours about what he called the good old days, along with other things. I could trust him with any of my secrets and he trusted me with his. My grandfather died back in March, and it was all a bit of a mystery, as the doctors couldn't determine the exact cause of death. The best guess was a heart attack. My grandmother said he just fell over. Ever since his death, a few things have been happening. One night, I had a very strange dream. In the dream, I was at my grandparents' house, and my grandmother was nowhere to be found. After a few minutes, I heard a knock on the front door. Now, growing up, I was always told to never open the door if I wasn't expecting someone. Just something my paranoid grandmother always told me. But for some reason, in the dream, I completely forget the rule, and I open the door anyway. There, standing behind the door, is my grandfather. Except he looks different. His skin seemed more pale than usual and the cane he used to keep from toppling over was gone, and he had no trouble standing properly on his own. But the most noticeable difference of all, he was completely covered in bugs all over his body. There were butterflies, bees, moths, and other insects. Then my grandfather spoke, but it wasn't his normal voice. It was hoarse and low, like he had been screaming and lost his voice. He croaked out, Help me. I assumed he meant with the bugs, so I quickly moved my hands frantically in front of him in an effort to shoo them away, and they flew off of him. The last thing I saw before the dream ended was his face. It was pale like the rest of his body, but his white beard was gone, and his eyes were closed with his mouth wide open. As his body tilted to fall into me, I woke up in a cold sweat, hyperventilating. Now I wouldn't think much of this dream, and I would have chalked it up to being just that, just a dream. That is, if my grandmother hadn't told me a few days later that she had the exact same dream. A few days after that, I was walking through the woods behind my house. As I was walking, I heard someone call my name. I stopped and I thought I was imagining it when I heard it again. I began walking towards the voice and soon enough I got to where the voice was right in front of me, but I couldn't see anything at first. Then there next to the tree was my grandfather. I was certain it was him. This man had his white beard and hair, his round body, and he even had the cane with him this time. Grandpa gave me a smile and waved at me. Then he laughed, and it was his unmistakable laugh. I rubbed my eyes to make sure I wasn't imagining things, but when I looked back in his direction, he was gone. A few more odd things happened. My computer will sometimes turn on and off by itself. I heard knocking sounds outside my window, and the items I inherited from my grandfather keep disappearing then reappearing in places that I didn't put them. Has anyone else experienced things like this after a loved one has passed away? Please tell me. I certainly hope that these stories help you to usher out 2020 
and into 2021. Much like the subjects of tonight's stories were ushered from one side of the veil to the other. All things must change. It's the only constant in life. And it's still relatively early, so you have time to pop open that champagne, wait for the ball to drop in Times Square, and toast to the new year. I wish each and every one of you health and happiness in this coming year. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends, and Happy New Year.